I'm very pleased uh, that we can have this um, lunchtime conversation with Sarah Longwell. As with the other speakers, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Sarah, you're about um, 20 feet high on a screen uh, in this ballroom, uh, as well as being seen on uh, Zoom. Uh, you can find uh, Sarah's full biography at, um, on the, in the program or online in the program. Uh, but she is the um, uh, CEO of Longwell Partners and the publisher of The Bulwark, uh, which publishes a lot of really important content uh, in this area. She's also a, a leading uh, pollster and uh, has been doing a series of focus groups uh, with Republican voters and other voters that's been very, uh, uh, offering some very interesting results. And, and that's, that's where I want to turn. So first, uh, welcome, Sarah. Let's uh, make sure you can say hello and we can hear you. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? I, you know, I, I uh, love being 20 feet tall because I'm actually very yes. short in real life. Yes. So it's great yes. to know that I'm looming large there. Great. You're, you're coming in loud and clear. Okay. So my first question is, uh, we often hear uh, statistics about large percentages of Republican Party voters believing Donald Trump's false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. Is this a real belief? Or is this more of a way of showing loyalty to Trump, a kind of performative uh, aspect? Uh, what are the beliefs that Republican voters, uh, rank and file voters, uh, hold about the election system in, uh, about in 2020 and, and more generally? Yeah, so, um, yeah, you see these sort of big numbers, right? Like 70% of the Republican Party believes that the election was stolen. Uh, but not all of the people in those, you sort of have to bucket people out because they, 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 while that big number is true, uh, there are different ways that people think about the election. So there is uh, a group of people for whom like Dominion changed votes. Like they believe sort of the deep conspiracy side of this. And let's say these are kind of kind of deep in um, the OANN, Steve Bannon, media ecosystem and universe. Um, and they are people who today still very much hold firm to the idea. Uh, a lot of them are, are still very much Donald Trump supporters. In fact, in the focus groups, one of the biggest indicators that I find of somebody who still very much wants Trump to be the nominee in 2024 is that they absolutely believe that the election was stolen in 2020. And it's not like a lightly held or a, or a tribal pose. It's no. These, these, this is, we have a corrupt election system. They were going to do anything they can to get rid of Donald Trump. The Dominion machines were corrupt. And, um, and that's one bucket. There's another bucket that is um, much more, it's much more of a tribal pose, you know, the, where they say, you know, Democrats cheat. I don't like Democrats and they cheat. Uh, and I just, something was fishy. Something was off about the election. Uh, these people are, are, are great in focus groups because they say things like, uh, well, uh, when I went to bed election night, Donald Trump was winning. And when I woke up, Joe Biden was winning. And how do you explain that? And you say, well, they counted more votes overnight and Joe Biden pulled ahead. And that is definitely an insufficient uh, answer. But they don't have this like concrete idea or some grand conspiracy. They just sort of think something was off. And, and this is where the media ecosystem on the right is really important because you did have a lot of people both uh, in the media and also elected officials who were sort of treading a line that was like, well, you know, there's always some fraud and, you know, that we need to do more about election integrity and security. Um, and so that's like a different bucket. Um, and a lot of the people in this bucket, of uh, they say right now, these are these are people who want to are interested in moving on to, to Ron DeSantis. Um, they are not sort of the always Trumpers. And one of the reasons that they want to move on to Ron DeSantis, I always find this interesting, is because they think he is more electable. Donald Trump has been losing elections. And implicit in that rationale is the idea that the 2020 election was not, in fact, stolen, uh, that Donald Trump is losing elections, that he is alienating too many people. And that's something that's pretty clearly articulated. There's also like a third group that I would just throw out there that's a much more... <clears throat> It's it's the the Molly Hemingway rigged argument, um, which I, I don't know if people are are familiar with this, but this is the idea: not that there were Dominion machines, not that there was ballot dumping, but that because of the pandemic, Democrats passed laws, made rules uh, that sort of changed the game. Uh, and this is sort of a more Wall Street Journal friendly argument that it was about the rules changes that were unfair uh, because of the pandemic that sort of tipped the put the thumb on the scale 
uh, for Democrats. And so th they don't, the, the, that big number contains sort of a range. Uh, and I would say that you're seeing that number come down somewhat because that sort of middle group after the midterms, the midterms were one of these things where a bunch of people had to say, you know what, we're losing. Uh, you know, and, and so that I think it started to eat away at sort of that middle bucket that I was talking about. Uh, so um, you, you started to address this when you talked about 2020 versus 2022. Uh, what do you think the attitudes are about fair, the fairness of the upcoming 2024 elections, or, or are we too far out from that? I mean, one, one thing I've noticed is Donald Trump started saying, we've got to start doing what he's calling ballot harvesting. So there's maybe not going to be an attack on mail-in votes. But do we have any sense of where things are headed going forward? So this is one of the most interesting things to happen after 2022 is that the way that there's a lot of self-soothing that that goes on on the right. And uh, one of them is, well, Democrats have, have changed the rules uh, that are favorable to them, and we need to do that, too. Um, and, you know, Donald Trump waged an all out assault on mail in voting. And there's a bunch of people in the Republican Party, including people like Steve Bannon uh, or the guys at talk, uh, Turning Point USA who say, uh, we have to play this game too. Uh, we cannot sort of cede this to Democrats. And uh, that is ultimately sort of a positive thing in the sense that they are saying, uh, well, they are made, using it as an excuse for why they were losing, that they're not participating in this, which means that I think you're going to see some of them become more open to some of the um, election reforms that make voting more accessible. And so the language that they use will sound adversarial in the way that they do it. But ultimately, the outcome is, is that more people, I think, are open to, um, yeah, more, more making making access easier. Um, so not just focusing on Republican voters, but on voters generally. In this polarized atmosphere, what do we know about uh, voters' tolerance towards authoritarian ideas, towards using violence to resolve close elections. Has anything changed in the American uh, public on these issues or, or, or not? I mean, certainly people do not say things like, um, I really like authoritarianism, right? No, okay. Nobody says that. Uh, and nobody says I like violence. Uh, you know, people condemn violence uh, when you, it, it's, but they, they also, rationalize things um you know uh they like they think what happened like voters when they talk about january 6th it was wrong you know the people going in there uh but they do a lot of what about you know well what about black lives matter why were the people on january 6th punished but the black lives matter uh people weren't but generally speaking uh no i i just i think the thing about violence is the temperature is really high uh, around politics now, and we have elected officials. You know, it, it used to be that elected officials, <clears throat> you could sort of expect them to understand that their words mattered, that they had to choose them carefully, that they would have some followers that would take things uh, in a in a hot environment uh, in, and, and take things too far, and that it was their responsibility to bring that temperature down. And that just wasn't what Donald Trump did, right? Donald Trump, his plan, and he will do this going forward too, is to turn that temperature up all the time. He does not have uh, a responsible bone in his body. And so, uh, you know, I always, I, I now obviously worry there's, I, I used to be somebody who maybe was a little skeptical of a ton of violence. Um, and I have become more and more concerned about it. Um, just because now we've seen a lot of evidence that people are willing to go there. And part of it is that we have irresponsible elected officials who tell people, uh, this is like 1776. You know, this a, a sacred election was stolen from you. I mean, imagine if you're a person and you're being told um, this election was stolen there. They think this is I always tried to um, th they believed they were doing the right thing. They believed they were fighting for democracy uh, in, in what they were doing. And that's sort of the scariest part when the people who are doing the wrong thing believe they're the good guy. So let's turn to Donald Trump. Um, and his standing in the Republican Party today. Is, is he the prohibitive favorite to win the nomination over someone like Ron DeSantis? Will indictments help him, hurt him, make no difference? What, what's the state of the Republican electorate right now? Yeah, it's absolutely too soon to say. I mean, I've been doing this, oh, I've been answering this for a version of this question a lot. 
And the thing is, is uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff we have not seen. So Donald Trump, we have not seen much of uh, over the last year. I think it remains to be seen whether or not he can repeat, whether or not he's still the same guy, whether or not his 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 shtick uh, is like completely sort of tapped out with voters or can he still fill, fill stadiums? But at least with you know Donald Trump, one of the things I would say about voters is their relationship with Donald Trump is very deep, sort of good, bad, ugly. They know what Donald Trump's about. There's nothing new they can learn about him. Their relationship with Ron DeSantis is incredibly shallow. So in the focus groups that I do them just about every, I do them every week and I uh, disproportionately focus on Republican voters, there's a strong appetite to move on from Donald Trump. He is not electable. Um, we need somebody younger. We need somebody who can win. And Ron DeSantis is always the name that comes up and has been for months and months and months, going back to before uh, the election. But their relationship to him is quite shallow, right? They've seen him on TV as the governor of Florida. They like what he did with COVID. Um, they like how he's standing up to the media. They think he's a fighter. Um, but they don't know tons about him. And so Ron DeSantis has this problem where we still, you know, we saw for the first time he's had to answer some of these national questions. We just learned what his position is going to be on Ukraine, which is indistinguishable from, from Donald Trump's. And uh, I think that was a hard thing to learn for a bunch of people in the party who would like to have an, a, an elected leader who has a different position on international affairs uh, than Donald Trump. But I think that Ron DeSantis, um, while a lot of people do want to move on from Trump, he's untested. And when they see him on the national stage, how will they feel about him is a totally unanswered, unknowable question, whether or not he's got the stuff. It's why you're seeing these stories come out about him being kind of prickly and kind of a little maybe a weird guy. There's a story that actually I thought was the first thing that humanized DeSantis for me about him eating pudding with three fingers uh, in front of his staff. Like that, uh, that kind of stuff is going to start to come out from him. He's going to be under the glare of a national spotlight and how he does. And he's also going to have Trump attacking him in the most grotesque ways imaginable. And so those dynamics, I think, are pretty unclear. I will say this. One of the things I started asking in the focus groups was, um, well, actually, two things. But one was, if Ron DeSantis disappeared tomorrow, would you vote? Would you be interested in Nikki Haley or Mike Pence or Mike Pompeo or somebody else in the field? Or would you go back to Trump? Most people say go back to Trump. Um, and so I think if Ron DeSantis does flame out, um, I think Trump, uh, I don't think people are looking for Nikki Haley. Um, the other thing is, is that Trump very much has a floor. Uh, I think in in while the polling is kind of all over the place and Trump versus DeSantis, one thing that's pretty clear is that Trump is holding on to a hardcore 30% of the party, basically no matter what. And in fact, if he went and ran as an independent, uh, I did this in a poll with Whit Ayers, a GOP pollster, 28% said they would vote for him as an independent candidate, even with a Republican on the ticket. Now, I think that number is too high. I don't think that number sticks long term, but it does mean that he's got this devoted core. And whether or not in a either a crowded field in, in 2024, just like in 2016, um, or if Ron DeSantis loses altitude, the ability for Donald Trump to get a winning plurality, um, you know, he doesn't have that much further to climb. And that's what's so dangerous about uh, about Trump. And on the indictments question in particular? Oh, I'm sorry. Make a difference? Yeah. So here's the thing about the, um, I think that, again, First of all, I think the indictments are a little different. I, I sort of think this New York one, the Stormy Daniels one, is not a great one to start with because people, it's like a sillier one um, that I just, and 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 when Trump, Trump is sort of at his best for him, and I, I use that term advisedly best, but he is able to take sort of the lemons of an indictment and turn it into a PR kind of lemonade because there's this rally round Trump effect that happens um, where whenever he's aggrieved, uh, He's able to be that avatar for everybody else's grievance. They they come after me like they'll come after you. Um, I think that the long term, you know, one of the things people talk about when they say that that we should move on from Trump is the baggage is like the constant, um, you know, this guy's just got a lot going on, and and so I think it it doesn't help him long term necessarily. But right now, one of his issues is he wants everyone to be talking about him all the time. That helps him, and. The, if if he is indicted, they will talk about him all the time, and he can find a way, I think, to use that to claw back uh, into the poll position a little bit better in a way that in a way that nobody else can. Like this is something that is very unique and specific to him 
in terms of his ability to take very negative things and turn them into increased devotion from his followers. I've got uh, a couple more questions, and we have we'll have time for a few questions um, uh, from the audience in person. So if you do have a question, you can line up uh, at the mics. Uh, so Sarah, in the 2022 elections, we saw election denier candidates lose support in swing states compared to non-denialist uh, Republican candidates. Uh, one study uh, I saw found a 2.3% decrease in support for denialists running in these swing states, but denialists won in other states uh, where the races were not closely contested. Um, is election denialism a losing issue? I'm putting Trump aside, but for, for others, um, did, did, did it cost, for example, uh, Republicans in Arizona their statewide seats? So here's the... I, I always caution people about trying to identify like a single issue in a vacuum that contributed to the 2022 losses. Cause the way that it, the way the voters would talk about it. And I did all I did going to 2022 was talk to swing voters. So Trump 2016, Biden 2020 voters and uh, who were, and who for the, for the most part, quite disaffected with Joe Biden um, and quite unhappy with the state of the country. But when, and they wanted to vote for Republicans, you would ask them, you know, who would you like to vote for? And that, wow, we really need a change. And I like, split, you know, divided government. And then say, okay, who are you going to vote for? Blake Kelly, or sorry, Blake Masters um, or or Kelly. And they're like, I'm not going to vote for Blake Masters. He's crazy on abortion. He's an election denier and he likes the Unabomber. And so they they took the election denialism and the positions on abortion, which often came with other weird uh, issues or things that these people were, and it just created a ball of extremism. They saw these candidates as too extreme and whether it was, um, uh, Carrie Lake, whether it was Doug Mastriano, whether it was Tudor Dixon, you know, Tudor Dixon, for example, uh, election denialism wasn't nearly what people knew about her. It was actually the fact that she had said that a young, young girl, uh, I can't remember the age, but it was like a 12 year old girl was raped. She should have to carry the baby to term. Every voter in Michigan knew that position. And that was it. Tudor Dixon was done over that. The election denialism was also in there as a thing that they said, these people are just crazy. Uh, governor of Wisconsin, same thing. They just thought, uh, or the, the guy who was running against Evers, uh, whose name is escaping me, but the that was sort of throughout. And so I think election denialism was a marker of extremism that was rolled into other things. All right, here's my last question before we go to the audience questions. Uh, but it's to me, this is the most important one. It's about looking forward. Uh, so for those of us who care about free and fair elections and think that a big part of that is public confidence in free and fair elections, um, what are your recommendations about messaging, campaigning, and organizing so that the US election system can continue to function and so that denialists are not able to, one way or another, try to subvert fair election outcomes? Yeah, so one of the things I've been a little surprised about is um, I often think people play far too much defense and not nearly enough offense. Um, and the we have a we have a big problem with trust in institutions overall. Uh, but when it comes to elections and election administration, especially down to the volunteers who are part of it, I think that there needs to be an affirmative campaign that helps people understand that these are their friends and neighbors, that this is that these people are, it's an act of good civic hygiene. We are not doing nearly enough to lower the temperature and humanize this process and take it away from the conspiracy theorists. And everybody wants to sort of play defense and try to bat down what the conspiracy theorists are putting out there. Don't do that. There needs to be an affirmative message about who the people are who are working on elections, which tend to be like, the 65-year-old retiree who's been doing this for 10 years, uh, who's a Republican. And you've got to get their faces out there. You've got to tell their stories. Um, and I, I feel like that's a thing that's really been, uh, been, been missing in terms of creating that sense of community around it so that you can't allow, like, the thing that is tearing us apart and creating our polarization is the lack of trust. And I think that rebuilding that trust is hard and people sometimes don't want to, like, do the really hard work of that, but it's about putting faces on this process um, and demystifying it to some degree. All right, thanks for that. All right, so we're gonna go to questions and we'll start over here. And with Chara, just identify yourself and sure. um, uh, uh, ask your question. Hi, um, my name is Chara torres Felici. I'm a professor of law at Stetson University College of Law in Florida. I was wondering when you're doing Republican focus groups, whether anything from the Dominion suits against Fox ever come up? 
Uh, not so much. Uh, not so much. You uh, would be maybe not surprised uh, to know that uh, in the groups that we have done recently, since that has come out, they are much more likely to be aware of the Tucker Carlson January 6th footage um, and the idea that January 6th was not as big a deal as the media had originally made it out uh, than they were to know about the text messages uh, from Tucker. Now, there was just a poll that came out that said that two out of every five Fox voters, um, you know, had knew something about the text messages. Um, but it, unless, it, you know, and this, one of the things I, I um, try to stress about voters and the focus groups, people sometimes have this impression that they're super read up on all of this stuff. But half the time, uh, the thing that we think we are all talking about, this happens all the time. I remember when Kevin McCarthy, it came out that Kevin McCarthy, um, remember he had said that Liz Cheney, or he had said to Liz Cheney on a call uh, that Trump should resign. And uh, it, that was in like Jay Mart's reporting and McCarthy came out and denied it. And then they released the audio of McCarthy saying it. And DC is just in flames over this. It's all we're talking about. And I went into a focus group that night what have you heard about the McCarthy tapes? No one had any idea what I was talking about. Like they just, nobody had heard about it. Same with Helsinki. That happens all the time. And so, um, you know, they are just, they are not aware of what happened uh, with, with the Fox text messages and the Dominion stuff. And nobody, nobody brings it up. Nobody said it has not had any diminished impact on Tucker is still the most cited show. When you ask people, Fox itself did lose um, some altitude over calling the election for Joe Biden. People were mad at them over that. Uh, and when you ask them, like, which shows do they watch? You can tell it is when people say they watch Tucker, they are a one type of person who thinks about politics one type of way. When they say they watch Brett Baer in the five, uh, they tend to be sort of in a different bucket. And the Brett Baer bucket is can almost be mapped to, I want to move on from Trump. He's got too much baggage. And the Tucker is, which is funny because Tucker said he passionately hates Trump. Um, but the Tucker viewers are very clearly uh, much more likely to be in the still pro-Trump camp. If I could just follow up on that a little bit, which, which way does the causation run? Like, is this a supply issue or a demand issue or are they feeding into each other? So I talk about something a lot that I call the Republican triangle of doom. Uh, and it is the toxic and symbiotic relationship between the elected uh GOP officials, the Republican voters, and the right-wing infotainment media. And it is mutually reinforcing, um, right? So an election denialism is a perfect example of this, where when you started out, some voters, Trump is saying the election is stolen. There are voters who believe them, and they're furious at Fox News for calling the election. And so there's a media ecosystem that is right there to say, yes, this was a stolen from Trump. Uh, and so that right-wing media infotainment system, it kicks into gear. And then the elected officials start to say, oh, no, our voters are going to want to hear that this is stolen. And so the elected officials start to say, uh, yeah, something was really off about this election, which leads more another category of Republican to be like, wow, something must have been wrong with this election. And it just keeps reinforcing each other until you get 70 percent of the party believing that an election was stolen. I'll take a question from this side, please. Oh, hi, uh, David Holtzman again. I've, uh, I graduated from the UCLA, UCLA School of Law and the Public Interest Law Program. I've uh, been a poll worker, uh, president of a League of Women Voters chapter here in LA, and uh, advocate for electoral reform. Um, with your polling and your public opinion research, um, Ms. Longwell, you say that mm, people think it's like 1776 all again, and they really believe that they're fighting for democracy uh, when they're obviously not really doing that. They have this belief. I have a question is really about how strong that belief is. And the way I want to ask it is, you know, how much of what they're doing is not so much because they believe the election was stolen, um, but they like the people they're hanging out with. They, they um, see this as an opportunity to have fun and make points with their social group and uh, maybe you know, come out with some sort of social halo out of this or you know, even impress the 
members of the opposite sex, like a lot of <laughs> radicals used to do when I was younger. Um, how, how real? How strong? Have you researched this question? How much they really believe it versus uh, and and how? And, and also, like when I was in college, I did a paper on you know reasons to lie for pollsters, and the professor who was a pollster gave me an A on it. Um, how much do you think they're telling you the truth when they're saying they really believe this stuff? Well, I think your point about uh, the way that community impacts this is really, it's really, I mean, this is the tribalism and the negative polarization are driven by a sense of them versus us. Uh, and, you know, the, but the question of how much does somebody believe it and whether or not they're telling me the truth, I mean, I, you know, I can't tell you exactly how much they're telling you. I will say when we do the focus groups, one of the things we're super clear about is we don't do mixed groups. It's not like we have Democrats and swing voters in there with Republicans. When we start a group, we always say, hey, y'all voted for Trump. Y'all viewed it, you know, view him very favorably or whatever the screener was. So that they know immediately they're with a group of like-minded people and they tend to feed off of each other the same way I think social groups exist in the world. Uh, which is that, yeah, are they trying to make jokes for each other? Do they like being part of the same community? Do they make fun of Democrats and, and libs? Uh, they do. But I also think that's how people act in the world. And I think we're seeing a pretty honest reflection. But I think it's a little bit of both, right? It's And this is, there's no, this is again, not a silver bullet. People are kind of a weird salad. There's a bunch of things going on in there. Um, and one of them is, hey, the people in my tribe think it's cool that I showed up at a protest at the Capitol and I wanna see how hard, you know, show them how hardcore I am. That's why they're posting it on social media because it is a validation to their tribe. Um, at the same time, I presume they believe it enough that, you know, they thought they could break into the Capitol and somehow if they stopped, you know, they would overturn the election. I I don't know, but uh, they, I, I think that they believe it uh, I, like I said, I think there's shade. There's different groups of people that believe it to di my opening question was just this, that, that people believe it to different degrees. Um, but I do think that there are some that absolutely think Dominion changed the votes. But there's the same people who see a lot of them believe that, you know, QAnon's a thing uh, because they see conspiracies everywhere. All right. We have time for one last question. We'll take the question on this side. Hey, uh, Brendan Nyhan from Dartmouth. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'm Hi. wondering how uh, worried you are about the 2024 playbook, uh, sorry, the 2020 playbook being run back in 2024, just less about your focus groups and more about your broader kind of network of, of folks and how you think the Republican Party is or is not changing its direction, right? As, as Rick said, you know, there may have been a shift, maybe it wasn't that big. Um, so I'm wondering first, how worried are you based on what you're hearing about that overall uh, direction, right? Um, you know, given, for instance, what we saw in Arizona in 2022. Um, and then second, how worried are you about uh, Ron DeSantis taking this kind of different approach, but also using government power in a way that makes some people squeamish um, about, a, in some cases, a different set of, of democratic norms. He was kind of uh, election overturning curious, but he never quite went as far as Trump did. So I wonder how you, as someone who's a very prominent anti-Trump Republican, think about him. Thanks. There's a bunch of questions in there, so you may have to repeat <laughs> them. Uh, so I'll just say broadly, in terms of my level of concern, um, I am very alarmed. I have been very alarmed for some time. I sustain a relatively high level of alarm uh, at all times, um, in, in, in part because uh, what I see, not just in the focus groups, but generally in the Republican Party, um, has genuinely shocked me. Um, and and I've, I am now live in a state of being like shocked, but not surprised. I was shocked, but not surprised to see DeSantis call the Ukraine uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a territorial dispute. Uh, that's, uh, that's, it really is unbelievable. And yet, tactically, I understand, okay, Ron DeSantis has decided he is going to run by trying to pick off Donald Trump's base, and he is going to have there be no daylight between his and Trump's policy positions. Uh, but my concern, I think my highest order concern is, again, some of what I outlined electorally, which is I genuinely see a path for Donald Trump to become president again. And uh, I, I can't, if I don't, we don't have time to run through the thought exercise of what a second Donald Trump term could look like, but I would just ask you to genuinely 
think for a minute about what it would mean for our country to have had somebody try to overturn an election and then for us to democratically reelect that person, what it would mean for the world order. Um, it's, uh, it is a, it is catastrophically frightening. And so I feel like we should be doing everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's, that puts you in a, in a tough position because Ron DeSantis, who's basically copying Trump, then is the alternative right now. It seems to be the best alternative. Now, it, does that dynamic remain? I don't know. I will say that the Republican party has moved to a place where somebody like Nikki Haley, somebody like Mike Pence, somebody like Mike Pompeo, Chris Christie, just any of the people who are from the before times, before Trump, um, you know, BT, uh, nobody wants them. I mean, people say in the focus groups, we're not going back. Uh, and they mean that. They mean America first. Donald Trump showed us a path. We're staying on this path. And so the party has changed and they have not yet figured out. I mean, we are watching Donald Trump do the same thing he did in 2015. We are watching a Republican party that continues to be paralyzed by this, not attacking him. The candidates are not taking him on directly yet. I mean, Nikki Haley's the only one really in, but there's lots of people who have a major interest in Donald Trump not being the nominee. And it's still like a coin toss that he could be. Um, so I am alarmed uh, by all of those things. And I'm just alarmed by the general direction of the party. Like it's good that a bunch of the election deniers were defeated in the midterms. A lot of people had to work really hard to do that. We had to convince a ton of swing voters. Uh, and without the abortion ruling, I'm not sure it goes that way. Uh, and so I think we're still in a tough place. And I think sustaining that level of alarm is hard for people. But you know what? The one thing I know about authoritarian playbooks is that they want us to be exhausted. Um, and so the biggest thing for all of us is to, when we stare this stuff down, to not become exhausted by it, to know that we still have to chip away. I spend my time constantly trying to give people that like Al Pacino speech in any given Sunday that like every day we've got to fight for the five inches in front of our face. We are not going to, we are not going to win over the always Trumpers. We are not going to convince mass amounts of people, but like we've got to pull 5% of people into that pro-democracy coalition and we've just got to build that and we've got to build it to, to be enough to beat back the illiberal forces on the specific thing about DeSantis, you know, versus Trump. Like one guy did a coup and one guy hasn't yet. Both have illiberal impulses. We're seeing a lot of that from DeSantis. If Donald Trump had never existed and Ron DeSantis showed up in this form, I would have the same reaction to him, I think, that I'd had to Donald Trump back then, which is to say, this guy's not a conservative. He's running these silly culture wars. He's an unserious person, um, just trying to wedge people apart. Uh, I still think he's preferable to a second term of Trump and that I'm in, a, I'm in an anybody but Trump mode for the primaries. And then I think that the only way that the Republican Party reforms itself in the long term is through sustained electoral defeats. And I think we have to continue to try to deliver those. Well, those are some sobering thoughts. <laughs> You've cheered us all up. Uh, thank you Keep very much, Sarah. There, guys. <laughs> Join me in thanking Sarah for joining us. And we now have a, a break until 1.30, and the panel that's on at 1.30 should just come uh, up uh, just before then. Thank you.